Hello viewers, I'm SB and this is Endless Space 2 Penumbra, the third major expansion for Endless Space 2, which I think is a pretty great game. That's maybe a little bit on the easy side, but pretty great. Uh, so, if you've been around the channel for a while, you know that uh, we have played this game in the past, but if this is your first time ever seeing Endless Space 2, don't worry, uh, you will not be forgotten. We will explain what we're doing, the mechanics as we go through here, uh, so that everybody can be caught up. So today we're going to be playing as the new faction that the expansion has added, the Umbral Choir. An ancient, immaterial creature from the depths of intergalactic space, the Umbral Choir roamed the cold, empty wastes, terribly alone, until a great cry of anguish pierced the darkness. Shattering into a choir of echoes, the fractured creature sped toward the source of the space and time-rending whale, the Endless Galaxy, seeking to salve that which was in pain. Unbeknownst, to the Umbral Choir, the cry marked the dying scream of the endless civilization, and as it arrived millennia later, new life was emerging from the remnants. Still wishing to give peace to any who suffer, the Umbral Choir will remain in the shadows, infiltrating and watching until it is ready to act. There's a weird, there's an interesting tonal uh, thing going on here, where they've made the faction appear kind of terrifying. But then its whole thing is trying to end suffering, but then it's going to end the suffering by infiltrating and watching you from the shadows. And this is really neat. I'm curious to see where this goes. So, our basic faction affinity is in the shadows. We possess a hidden home system located on a special node that can be migrated to another special node for a cost. We cannot colonize systems in the normal fashion, but we can place hidden sanctuaries on planets. We can abduct sleeper agents from enemy populations, to bring them back to the home system as enhanced population, and we are immune to influence conversion, but our ships can be attacked in Cold War even when on our home systems, which is usually a place where your ships are pretty safe. That's, uh, that's very interesting, and again, still that sort of weird tonal contrast of we're abducting sleeper agents from enemy populations, you know, to ease all suffering in the universe. So our core population type is the Umbral Choir. Uh, each turn, each unit of Umbral Choir produces one science and one... Um, topped out speedometer? I don't have any idea what that is. Our faction traits are immaterial population, with, mi with umbral choir rates minimally manifesting in the physical universe, manpower stocks suffer stunted growth. Okay, so ordinarily, food becomes manpower, which is a military, you know, you use food to uh, feed soldiers. It becomes military manpower, which is a, use a resource that you use to uh, fight planetary battles. Apparently we're real bad at producing manpower. However, we do get extra manpower from idle bandwidth on the Empire. Okay, so that's bandwidth. This is part of the hacking system. I have uh, intentionally not learned a huge amount about the expansion mechanics, because I think it's more interesting to learn them together. But uh, I do know that bandwidth is part of the new hacking stuff. I do not know what the new hacking stuff does exactly. We have plus one maximum hacking operations on our Empire. Apparently, we are a diffuse organism spread across light centuries. Yeah, what a weird, interesting idea. There's definitely some similarities here between the Umbra Choir and the uh, the Mycara, the new faction in the new Endless Legend expansion, which is also sort of a spread out colony of a single being. Oh, wow, we have a lot of traits. We are fledgling traders, uh, minus 50% star system trade value. We have extra hacking speed. All of our ships can cloak, except for the very, very largest classes of ships. Uh, we get plus one bandwidth per sleepers on Empire. Commandeering spare processing cycles from sleepers, cyber cybernetics, smart tech, and networked machines makes them an important source of hacking power. Do we know what sleepers are? Maybe it's part of the hacking system. Uh, okay, so we have a titanium mine and a hyperium mine on our home planet. That's pretty handy. Doubled system development luxury costs, which is probably not a big deal, because I think our whole deal is that we don't have a bunch of systems, right? Uh, we start with the Xenobiology tech unlocked, which is a very, very good technology. A lot of science to be had there. And Planetary Landscaping, which generates us lots of food. Okay, if you've ever played a 4X game before, you probably have a pretty good idea of what that entails. Science and food are real good starting resources. Our home system is Nexus. The Umbral Choir are outsiders to the Endless Galaxy, and Nexus is their hidden fortress from where they explore this new realm. As immaterial wraiths capable of infiltrating the logical foundations of machine and cybernetic systems, 
The Umbral Choir are masters of espionage, but equally are unable to colonize worlds by traditional methods. Nexus is their answer to this conundrum. A medley of constructed interlocking rings, this artificial world acts as a bridge between the material and immaterial domains, permitting the choir to fulfill their ambitions of ending the suffering in the galaxy. Okay, weird. That's a weird thing. There's going to be a lot of weird stuff going on here. We start with a democracy government with the pacifist political party in charge. Uh, my memory is that the pacifist political party is a pretty good one. And I'll be honest with you, I don't remember the mechanics uh, quite as well as I remember those of Endless Legends. So there's going to be some fumbling around here and there, but hopefully we know enough about what's going on here to have a pretty smooth game. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and start on Endless on the highest difficulty. Maybe this means that we get murdered and we do not win the game. That's okay. Losing is a pretty good way to learn things. Uh, eight competitors, pretty random galaxy settings. Let's get going. So, like I said, I don't really know very much about the new hacking system. I guess you must... This, the sleeper stuff that they're talking about must be part of it. Is you probably, like, you embed sleeper agents on systems and then they help with the hacking or something. Very curious to get into all that. Uh, but first, we're going to get a cinematic here. I love the Endless Space 2 cinematics. It's going to tell us a little bit more about who we are as a people. I definitely have some questions. Command, this is Pioneer 9. I'm picking up something weird. Over. Pioneer 9, this is Command. Nothing registering on our end. Can you confirm? Over. Command, there's definitely something out there. It looks... alive. It's getting closer. It's... it's... it's coming in! This is Pioneer 9. Disregard last update. Over. Pioneer 9, this is Command. Please confirm you are not in danger. Over. Command, this is Pioneer 9. Everything is in order. Out. Yeah, we're the good guys. We're the good guys here. Okay, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty interesting. So... Let's talk about Endless Space 2. Uh, first of all, we have our home system. Our home system, which is uh, just kind of orbiting a neutron star here. Is this safe? All right, so this is, uh, these are the planets, I guess. What, these are, they're crescents, they're called. Ordinarily, a system is a bunch of planets and you can colonize the planets and have points of population on those planets. Uh, we have some weird stuff going on here though. It's a little bit different for us. Uh, so this is our equivalent of a planet, this crescent. We have two points of population here. Each one of them is generating one science and one bandwidth, but also four science from the, the, from the uh, crescent itself, and three food, and four industry, and three dust. So each point of population is outputting all of that stuff, and that all together is how we get our system outputs. Um, one of the things I really like about Endless Space 2 is that at any zoom level, you can hit space and get an alternate view that has different information in it. Uh, for example, if we zoom way in here to get just like the cinematic view of our our cool little planet, if we hit space here, it gives us a bunch of made up scientific information about the planet, which I think is neat. Uh, if we pull out to this view, we can see 
you know, various different bits of information out here. We have the economy view. If we had a trade route or anything, we'd be able to see it here. Okay, so back to focus. We have a system here. Our system does not have any curiosities for us to play with. We have some ships. Let's have a look at our ship design. So, this is a Cord. It is a Sonata-class vessel. It's an exploration ship that is very, very fast and extremely good at using probes, starting with two probe modules and two engine modules. Wow, ten movement. That, that is a fast ship. So, we're going to send our two starting ships out into the galaxy to explore. But before we do that, we have a hero. This is what heroes look like. What is your deal, Mr. Hero? Right, so every hero has a skill wheel here that is made up of three parts. First of all, you have the common part. This is the same for all heroes. Everybody has the same skills here. Then you have a faction uh, part of the wheel that contains skills that, uh, that belong to your faction. Every hero has a faction, and over the course of the game we'll pick up a lot of different heroes. Some of them will be from other factions, and they will have different faction sections of their wheel. And then finally, you have a part of the wheel that is based on your hero's class. Every hero has a different class. This guy is a counselor. Uh, focuses on empire-wide resources as well as diplomacy. So let's just take a quick look at what we have in the Umbral Choir skill area. So we can improve our empire's bandwidth. We can add evasion to our fleet. Vision range. Industry for a system that our hero is governing. Okay. So a lot of uh, a lot of hacking, uh, hacking related stuff. Also, an all a boost to all resources per sleeper on system. We got to figure out what these sleepers are. So each hero can be assigned as either the governor of a system, or a the commander of a fleet. We're going to temporarily make this hero a fleet commander. I don't know for sure if he will uh, become a governor later or what, but. I definitely want him in this fleet for right now because there's a lot of XP to be earned by exploring the galaxy. We're going to try to level this guy up quickly. Now notice, his ship only has four move, and the movement speed of a fleet is the movement speed of the slowest ship within that fleet. So if we don't want to drag our scouts way down here, we're going to have to tack some extra engines onto this ship real fast. This will get it to seven, that would get it to the full ten. That upgrade's going to cost 90 of our 100 dust. Uh, dust is just the money of the Endless Universe. I'm comfortable doing this. Alright, now we're nice and fast. Let's just pick a direction and go. Actually, before we pick a direction and go, there are three star lanes that we could use to travel out of this system. Uh, but we only have two scout fleets. So what I'm going to do is fire off from this fleet, the non-hero fleet. Fire off one of my probes down one of the star lanes, and it will explore that for us. Okay, that's exactly the kind of information I was looking for. So down here we have an asteroid field, which is unfortunately not terribly valuable to us. We must have a hacking beacon in this node in order to benefit from its effects, but when we do, it will give 50 industry uh, back to our main, our main system. So that's pretty valuable. That's a lot of industry. So now we know that the nodes, the directions we really want to explore are these two. Okay, over here, we have the Izar system. A bunch of planets with some anomalies and deposits and stuff. There's some red sang and some transvine here. This is a low gravity system. Uh, for some reason, the tooltip is not displaying what low gravity does. It, these anomalies uh, affect the resource output of the system in various ways. And we can see here one unexplored curiosity. So let's dump a probe in there and find out what that is. Turns out it was a deposit of red sang. A red spice that uh, apparently people just really love. Can't get enough of that red sang, all of the people of the galaxy are known to say. Alright, over here we've encountered an occupied system. Here we have the Galvran. So we can make contact with them and our diplomatic relations with them will slowly improve over time. If we get the ability to communicate with them, we can uh, we can work our influence with them and hopefully get, uh, get our diplomatic relations up a little bit faster. They're a temperate faction that will provide 
resources to us if we if we make them happy with us, in particular dust. And they have the minds over matter trait. So if we make them happy enough with us, we can assimilate them into our empire. And if we do that, we'll gain this faction trait. Um, that's a lot of science. That would be a really nice trait to have. Alright, so we'll, we'll consider helping them out. For example, they have an unexplored curiosity in their system, and they would love it if we would work that out for them. So let's spend a probe on that. Turns out it was another Red Sang deposit. These systems are just lousy with Red Sang. Alright, so if we click on them now, you can see we are getting a an approval modifier for the fact that we revealed that curiosity to them. Uh, we will... Yeah, we'll praise them when we can. They definitely want to make some friends out here. So we may as well send out some probes. We're out of movement for the turn, but we still have three probes left, and we generate probes pretty quickly. So let's fire off a bunch of probes, just sort of into space. We're going to fly down this star lane next turn because there's nowhere else to go, so I'm not going to send a probe down there. We're going to find out what's down there. I'm going to send our probes off just kind of into other directions. Let's see if there are other constellations or systems hanging out nearby. So we discovered all these luxury resources. That's our hero. Uh, there's Eden Incense on our home system. Oh, no, 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 sorry. We discovered the existence of Eden Incense because it's the luxury resource our population likes. We'll talk more about how luxury resources are used a little bit later. A traveler of the wider cosmos, the Umbral Choir was drawn to the endless galaxy. All right, listen, narrator guy. We've, we've heard this story a couple of different ways now. I know what we're talking about. All right, so we have a couple of other things we need to do before we end the turn. First of all, on our home system, we need to be producing stuff. We are acquiring industry. We need to turn that industry toward the production of a project. Uh, we have a couple of options here. Science, dust, food, industry, and then, of course, the buildings that come from our starting techs. I think we probably want to start with the drone networks. Food and industry are very important at the beginning of any, uh, any one of these types of games. At the price of public resentment, counter-infiltration agents can first identify sleepers and then begin a process of decontamination, which returns the sleeper population to normal. It is restarted every time it ends until it fails to find any more sleepers. And while we're doing it, yeah, people will be upset that I, that minus 25% icon there is approval. It's important that your approval be high. Okay. Well, this is a thing we probably don't have to worry about just yet. Uh, we also have the ability to terraform our starting planet immediately, huh? Like trading in your first fondly remembered but lousy spaceship for the next model up, upgrading to a duo crescent is a bittersweet experience. So it just increases the resource output. There's no downside, but it takes a fair amount of industry to do it. Okay, interesting. There are a couple other things we need to do before we end the turn. We have this uh, this system now producing some drone networks. We need to pick a starting technology to research. Uh, I think we probably want to start with off-world agribusiness or xenolinguistics. We probably want to start with xenolinguistics. This is an awful lot of uh, industry here. Although, plus 10 industry per fertile and also per temperate. Our starting worlds are probably not either of those things, right? Yeah, our worlds are cold and sterile. So we're not actually going to get a huge amount of industry out of this building. It'll just be plus 10 industry for each each one of those crescents that we've actually built out. This will allow us to build the interplanetary transport network, which seems to have no stats at all. There was a tooltip bug that existed that sometimes, uh, sometimes excluded information from the tooltips uh, that apparently still <laughs> still is around. Well... I know that what the Interplanetary Transport Network does is give you extra industry on systems that have or on planets that have strategic deposits, and we know that our starting world has some. So I think actually plasma metallurgy is going to turn out to be better than xenolinguistics for us, provided that that really is a tooltip bug and that it's not the case that that building just doesn't do anything. Uh, I guess we're going to find out. All right, one more thing before we get uh, get moving on to the next turn here. We should probably stop in at the uh, at our government. So we have a democracy, which means we have three law slots in our Senate. Uh, it is not as expensive for us to run laws as it is for everybody else. Laws have a constant influence upkeep. 
Uh, and also, our people are just generally happier. So, let's pop in here. What laws could we be running right now? Well, we could be taxing our people more heavily. Uh, we could be converting approval, uh, basically taxing people more heavily and using the, the tax money to generate science. Uh, we could be reducing production, reducing industry output, but Im improving our approval. This can be pretty valuable. Uh, approval affects the food and influence output of systems, and then the approval of all of your systems together is averaged into an empire-wide approval level that has an effect on your dust and science output at the empire level. Uh, we also have a couple of laws that come from our political parties. So right now, our government is run by the pacifist party with scientists in a supporting role. So we have pacifist and scientist laws available. Uh, the scientist law just reduces the, the scientist law we have access to now, just reduces the cost of our system improvements. It's a pretty good one. And this lowers the cost of our diplomatic interactions with other factions. Um, I don't think that this is very valuable to us, but I do like this. It's going to cost one influence per population point, so two influence per turn right now. I think we can run that law. And then, what are we at? We're at 52 approval. I believe it is the case that our approval levels... Uh, approval is a stepwise formula that gives you benefits. It shifts from content to other categories at, at various levels of, improvement, uh, of approval. I believe it shifts at 40% down to unhappy and at 61% up to happy. So losing 20 approval right now would downgrade our resource output and we would lose dust and science. I think this is actually very negative. This, however, will only drop our approval, approval by four points, and that will not give us any penalties from where we are right now, but we will just get free science. Yeah, 48% is still content. We're just getting more science now than we were before. Okay, and with that, I think we are actually done. You guys are out of probes. I guess for the same reasons that it was sensible for us to send out probes up here, it is sensible for us to send probes out down here. Let's just shoot some probes in those directions. We'll see if we can uncover anything interesting nearby. Alright. Oh, I have hacking operations waiting to be assigned. Okay. What is that? What does that mean? What? Okay, this is not useful to me. Uh, how am... How am I hack? Click to enter hacking mode. Hacking mode. This allows you to draw the path of your next hacking operation, then launch it. We can also place defensive programs on our... Boy, I need some more information. Click on a valid node to place the starting point of your hacking operation. Well, I assume I have to start on nodes that I control, right? Now click on a node to place a waypoint on it or select it as the target of your hacking operation. Uh, okay. Estimated time in order for the hack to successfully complete... Hacking special nodes allows you to place a transmigration beacon. And I think we want to do that, right? Because this this node, if we get out of this view here, this node has in its tooltip that if we get a hacking beacon on it, we will benefit from its effects, right? Okay, I do not know how the hacking systems work. There's probably a tutorial for this, actually. I, I probably have all the tutorials turned off, but you know what? Let's see if we can re-enable something here. Uh, game, probably. Tutorial mode. Only explain high-level features of the game. Let's turn that on for now, because I bet there are tutorials related to the hacking system. Okay, the Silent Watcher has appeared to tutorialize us. The Umbral Choir's home system is invisible to others. They see They only see a special node. Yeah, so anybody who flew by would see that there's a neutron star here, but not that we are present doing weird stuff around it. And that's good news, as your home system will remain your only real system for the whole game. Your ships are also natively cloaked, which allows you to discreetly and safely explore the galaxy. Later, anti-cloaking modules will allow others to detect your fleets and home system, but stronger cloaking measures will allow you to remain undetected. Okay. 
Uh, are you sure you want to close this tutorial? This will prevent any further tutorial information from being displayed. Okay, no, I guess I just want to collapse it, probably. Okay. So our probes have not discovered anything else interesting for us. This is a strange piece of music that's playing. Alright, what have we in this direction? Nothing yet. And this scout ship doesn't really have anything to do. Okay, so we can only travel around the, uh, the star lanes for the time being. We will develop the ability to just shoot ourselves out into open space. But for right now, we do not have that. So I guess this scout ship also wants to head in this direction. Uh, and we have this... Okay, my hacking operation has reached the asteroid field and has start, can start hacking. If I own it, the hack will be instantaneous. Ah, here we go. This is what I needed. You can hack nodes you don't own. Hacking allows you to disrupt your enemies. You can use it to get new planets under your control, keep your enemies or allies in check, weaken them, steal their resources, and the cool thing is, it's anonymous. To start a hack, click on the glowing hacking button. I did that already. Click on the starting system, a system you own or one with a back door you own, to start a route from there, then click on the target system. The hacking outcomes you'll get depend on the type of system you target. Uh, keep in mind that a hack takes several turns before reaching its destination, depending on the distance. Okay, the hacking operation that we started is going to take two turns to go. Oh, but we have, we can be running two operations. So, I guess we want to start a new operation, right? We could raise encrypting st encryption standards on our system to reduce enemy hacking speed, but we're not going to get hacked right now. That's not a realistic concern. We don't know anybody who would hack us. So I want to run a hacking thing from here to Jane, maybe. We could hack this minor faction, which will allow us to alter their relations with ourselves and others. Yeah, okay. That seems like a good thing. So now we have two operations running, and we'll figure out exactly how this works when we get there. All right, let's move on. We are not very good at research for a faction that's so hacky and kind of, like, we're very computery, but we're not good at science. All right, well, continue. We've discovered up here a black hole. Uh, and I guess we'll just pick a direction for one of the fleets and the other fleet can go in the other direction. The system of Kerr. A binary star system with a bunch of lava worlds and burning gas planets around it. And also, some interesting curiosities. Let's have a look at these. We've discovered the Titanium Enhancer module. So a module that we could equip on our ships that would increase their projectile damage. And a star log that gave us 5 XP. And our hero has leveled up. So we have to make a decision here. We could keep this hero attached to this fleet, exploring the galaxy for a longer time, or we could, sometime in the near future, move the hero back to our system to function as a governor. If we do that, we'll gain a lot of influence from the system every turn. Honestly, I think we probably want to pull him back as a governor. So let's look at our skills in that context. If we take this skill, we can dramatically increase our empire bandwidth, which seems like it could be valuable. Uh, we could also get a skill that lets us improve the industry and food output of our system, or rather of our population, and a skill that just gives us food. Now, it's worth noting that every planet in our system is sterile, so this would be a lot of dust. How much bandwidth are we producing and how much do we need? Do I have access to that outside? Okay, I can only see that in this view. We are currently generating... 52 bandwidth per turn. So actually, 10 extra bandwidth isn't that big. Hmm. Alright, I think we want our hero to be a governor. That's not the button I wanted. Here we go. I think we want our hero to be a governor. It seems like 10 bandwidth is maybe not that big of a deal. I'm assuming this would be 10 if we put both points into it. You can see it's a two-point skill. So why don't we grab... Food, Industry, and Dust. And if it turns out we need bandwidth really badly, we can come back and get this. Uh, so, what do I value more? A very small amount of food and industry, which are, in my opinion, much better early game resources, or a larger amount of the relatively weaker dust. I think let's, let's go for Optimal Operations Expert. I like this skill quite a bit. 
So our hero has a reassignment cooldown of six turns. Once you assign a hero to a job, like commanding a fleet, they have to stick to it for a little while. So in six turns, we could pull Fessel Staccato back to our, uh, our system. But hopefully, we can spend those six turns out here in the galaxy getting XP a lot faster than we would get it if we were assigned to the system, which is why I assigned him to this fleet in the first place, despite not yet knowing what we wanted him to do. And we don't have any movement or or probes left, so we are all done with you. Our hacking stuff is, is hacking. It's hacking as fast as it possibly can, and we're doing this. Yeah, okay. Let us continue. I think that was the sound of our hack reaching the thing, so... We can install a transmigration beacon. A destructive but effective means of moving my main system at short notice. Placed on special nodes, the beacons act as a special receiver for high entropic digital snapshots that allow the relocation of the entire system with a cost to population and infrastructure if they're not fully charged. So this won't actually move our home system is my understanding from this. It will place a beacon that will allow us to move the home system later when it's fully charged, but we don't have to do anything. Uh, or if there was a lost home system here, we could reclaim it. So if, if we lost our home system, we could we would have some time to take it back. I guess it would not totally eliminate us immediately. Well, let's install a transmigration beacon. I don't. My understanding here is that this will not force us to move. And once we have the beacon up, we'll get control of the uh, we'll get control of the node and we'll benefit from the fifty industry. I think <laughs> we're gonna find out. Alright, so you can just move through here. You guys can go that way. But really, I guess we're mostly looking for other players here. We want we want to encounter other civilizations. Here we've discovered the Cephaloros, a bunch of jellyfish guys. They are a temperate people with the bountiful filtration uh, trait. 50% luxury deposit value, plus 50% luxury deposit value on fertile worlds, and plus 20 industry per system level on systems. That's a really good trait. And this is a strong population type. Alright, let us make contact. Hello. And we'll explore their, uh, explore their curiosities here, which will make them happy. Hopefully we can get them to want to join up with us relatively quickly. Even though we can't directly speak to them yet. Oh, that's true. I do have one hacking thing. Alright, you know how to set up a hack hacking operation, sort of. Now let's see how to defend yourself from one. After all, you don't want your fleets to be unable to move or to let others meddle with your economy. Click on the nice Defensive Program button over here to get a list of the available defensive programs. You can click on one defensive program from the list to add it to a known you own. You can add slash cancel them whenever you want. They all have a bandwidth cost and an effect that any rival's hacking operation passing through the node they are on. An effect on any rival hacking operation. Bandwidth determines the maximum number of executable programs. Each program uses bandwidth and blocks that bandwidth until the program ends. When the program ends, the bandwidth is freed up and can be, can be reused for another program. Okay. So. We may as well run encryption on our home system because... Right now, we just have loose bandwidth sitting around doing nothing. Okay, that makes sense to me. And then, we can draw a path of a hacking operation. So, like, what, what can I actually... Like, what is a useful thing I can do, though? What if I wanted... To, I guess we could send a hacking operation to Takim. It'll take a while for it to reach there. But we want to... We want to be able to mess with these minor factions, right? Alright, apologies about the stumbling around. Like, we'll, we'll figure out how hacking works. With the help of the tutorials, we will figure out what this system does. Alright, so we've got our drone program finished here. Yay, you got a beacon! It will grant your home system a nice, a nice portion of its bonuses. You can either migrate immediately and lose a high percentage of your population, or wait a few turns for safe migration. The longer you wait, the safer the migration and the lower your losses. If your home system had previously been detected, migration will make it invisible again. There are three ways a beacon could be removed. By hand, after a migration, or after trying to migrate to an already occupied special node. Alright, well. And so just like having the beacon here hanging out. Uh, you can migrate your home system here. 
which to instantly migrate your home system to this node, but it would be bad to do that, or it will be fully charged in 14 turns and we can do it then. And we're getting this bonus now, right? Yes, we are pulling in the 50 industry from that asteroid field. Hey, that's pretty good. You've discovered a system in a distant co constellation, but do you know how to read it? reach it? Oh, have I? Did we see a system outside of our... We did! Look at this! Columba in another constellation. Okay, I know how migration works. We don't actually need this tutorial. Okay. So... We also have our faction quest beginning. Humane Criv. What happened to me today? I was out in deep space, alone, chasing up some tenuous, endless relic leads from command when I came across, I don't know, something. I can't recall anything about it. All I remember is that I felt a kind of cosmic awe, but then I got afraid. Terrified, in truth. When I listen back to my exchanges with command, I get goosebumps at how scared I sound. The worst thing, though, is hearing myself say I must have been dreaming. I don't sound... myself. Maybe I've been out here too long. Maybe it's time I stop hunting endless relics. Maybe it's time I renounced my faith. Okay, so we get we get a little bit... With each of these uh, faction quest things, we're getting a little bit of dialogue from the woman we saw get brain hacked, and then a little bit of dialogue from the Umbral Choir. We came to offer solace, but the first offshoot of the Pilgrim Organism reacted to our presence with horror. We infiltrated its cybernetic systems, hid our existence so we might buy time to consider our next move. Now we watch the offshoot proceed onwards into the barren depths of this ancient galaxy, no sign of how it is controlled by the Overgestalt. We know the Pilgrim Organism craves to locate artifacts of a long-dead race. Perhaps we can help. Elsewhere, we feel other organisms trembling with pain and conflict, overwhelming us. We shall not have harmony until this galaxy stills, but the way forward is unclear. Do we stay in the shadows, or come into the light? Alright, so, we have a choice to make here. We could uh, take on the objective to purge or assimilate a minor faction, uh, preferably assimilate, and for as a reward we would get 30 dust. And upon making this selection, our population would be hit with a, uh, a boost to pacifist opinion. And that'll affect the way our elections go. That's a that's a thing we don't have to worry about right now. Or we could choose to just hide. Continue discovering systems and get ourselves some dust for doing so. Uh, we're pretty good at discovering systems. But we already know that we want to assimilate these minor factions. So I'm going to take this one. It might take us a little bit longer to do this than it would take to explore ten systems. But... Deciduous trees are a pretty good reward. Uh, we'll be able to use these in a system development upgrade, and that's a whole bundle of mechanics that we'll talk about when we get closer to doing it. I'm going to pick Unveil. We should make our first encounter and begin our mission of peace. People will find it creepy if we just, like, hang out and skulk in the shadows. Alright, so... We discovered the Kalmat here. This is a minor faction I've never seen before. They are warmongers, and they will provide more uh, manpower to us if we make friends with them than other factions would. They, okay, they give extra bandwidth, and their trait is minus 10% bandwidth cost on hacking programs. Alright, well, let's make first contact. We can't, we still can't speak to them yet, but we're getting closer. After we pick up Plasma Metallurgy, I think we're going to go into off-world agribusiness so that we gain the ability to uh, diplomatize with minor civilizations and also with the Pirate League. I don't know that we'll necessarily have a lot of work to do with the Pirate League, but I think this is what we want for our research path. Uh, your empire may have found the secrets of voyaging between the stars, but yeah, okay. Science production must be used to research technologies. This is all stuff that we already know about. I'll explain this all in time as, uh, as it becomes relevant. I'm going to leave the tutorial man on for a little bit because I would like explanation of hacking stuff, but... Probably a lot of his tutorials are things that I uh, I already know well enough to explain as they become relevant. Alright, let's build another thing. Hey, shh. Let's build another thing here. Uh, so we could build the Cerebral Reality Improvement, just get a little boost to our science and industry or science and dust output. And I will say, our science output feels a little bit low for my taste at this moment. Um, but we also could resolve that by building 
interstitial sciences. So it will give us 10 science per planet. Obviously, the fertile and tempered bonuses do not apply here. And it will also apply for planets on sanctuary systems. We haven't really figured out how to do sanctuary stuff yet. Um, let's get Cerebral Reality going. This is a better, so a better amount of science, and it has some dust att attached to it. We could really use a little bit more science. Our research is going slowly. Alright, so we have reached Takim and Circini. Let us... Oh, wow. Uh, we do have four probes charged up, so let's just explore all of these then. Alright, we found some strange fossils here. So this is an anomaly that has a beneficial effect on the planet, and also star logs worth XP for our ships. Uh, this planet is mineral rich, and we found a load of stuff that is giving us influence. We don't even know what, all we know is that it is giving us influence. A deposit of Eden incense, which is a luxury resource, and a deposit of Red Sang. Alright, so, uh, scouting anomalies is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, in this case, obviously, it's going to make the minor faction like us. But also, every time we discover an anomaly, it gives XP to our hero. So we can see right now our hero is at about halfway through level 2. We're going to deploy two of our probes here. And after doing that, you can see we've got a big chunk of progress toward level 3. So this is why it's important that we, uh, that we assign our hero to a fleet early on, because this early exploration phase is worth a ton of experience. And we discovered deposits of Red Sang and Eden Blossoms there. Or sorry, we already knew about the Eden Blossoms on that system. We discovered Propitious Seasons. This is not merely a planet that has the benefit of an axial tilt that produces seasonal variations. The seasons and their associated climates tend, uh, lend themselves well to agriculture. So this anomaly is giving plus food on this planet. I'm not sure why the yield is not appearing in the tooltip. It's supposed to be. Uh, whatever, it doesn't make a big difference. And also some more influence. So we have a bunch of influence that we could use to uh, speak with the people on these systems. If only we could talk to them. It's coming along. We'll have the tech soon enough. Also, we have five more movement here. But if we leave the system, obviously we can't continue to explore curiosities. So we're going to hang out here as our probes recharge and explore the rest of this stuff for them. Uh, and you guys are actually out of move, but when you have move, you'll want to keep going on here. So, hold on. How does this... What is, what is this sanctuary mechanic? We have the ability to establish sanctuaries on systems, right? This is one of our traits. I know how... Alright, tutorial man. You're getting real close to getting turned off over here. Didn't we see a thing about being able to set up... Okay, we're able to place hidden sanctuaries on planets. How does this work? We haven't seen anything about this yet, right? Uh, is this a thing that we have to research, maybe? Or maybe Tutorial Man is trying to tell me about this and I'm ignoring him. Okay, so as we progress through our scientific research, we're going to gain access to new hacking programs. That makes sense. Um, so ordinarily, people can just colonize planets, right? Obviously, we can't do that. But how do we work our sanctuary ability? How would, like, if I wanted to set up a hidden sanctuary on a sister, a planet in the Izar system, how would we do that? So these are the planets here. Okay, we are missing technology to do this. We need the PEV scale accelerators technology, which is down here. So we do, we need the appropriate colonization technology for the planet. Okay, that's a good start. Right now, we could potentially colonize, or set up sanctuaries on tundra worlds. So have we seen any stars that produce pretty cold worlds? This is a steppes planet, arctic. Okay, these worlds are too cold. Also, they're colonized already. Well, one of them is. Over here, we have... Desert, desert, and arid. Uh, this place is not exactly ideal for us. Uh, we know this stuff is all extremely hot. The Takim system is a little bit more pleasant. But, unfortunately, uh, 
already colonized, like we said. Okay, we'll keep looking around. We'll keep looking around for places that we could set up, and we'll do some research. Alright, so once we, uh... Once we've picked up Cerebral Reality here, I think we're going to want to expand to the other crescents. We're going to want to open up more space around our system. Uh, we are very, very slowly gaining population. You can see our food output is not fantastic. When we get enough food, we'll gain population points, and each point of population, uh, remember, has the yield listed on it, plus the yield of its planet, or in our case, its crescent. So each point of population is a significant amount of growth. Uh, we might want to... Pursue cyber farms. Actually, the cyber farms are pretty good for us, too, because all of our worlds are cold. You can see up here. So we do get, we get plus five food on each planet and an additional plus five food on each cold planet. So maybe this ought to be our next, the next thing we pursue. Yeah, all right. Uh, our hacking operations are running. We've almost reached Jane and the art in this game. I really love the way, I, like, pretty much everything looks. Uh, we don't have any extra hacking stuff we could be running, so even though we have uh, more bandwidth cap than we have allocated, we don't have anything to do with it. All right. So our hack has reached Jane. We can, here, create a backdoor. Backdoors can be hidden in a range of networked infrastructures, but most often target widespread critical systems with many layers of legacy code. Yep. Uh, so we could create a hidden backdoor which allows new hacking operations from this node and grants increased hacking speed on neighboring nodes. We could improve our image with this minor faction uh, through a mix of careful adjustments to internal diplomatic communiques combined with subtle propaganda programs. Uh, we could try to impersonate an ambassador if this minor faction had a suzerain. Uh, if that basically, if somebody was already allied with them, we could reduce their uh, their relations with that suzerain and make their praise and bribe act uh, actions very expensive in terms of influence. We can uncover their secrets. Focusing on discovering the dirty little secrets of a minor faction's decision makers gives significant light leverage, lowering the cost of our actions. Or we could hack their economy. By massaging bank data, manipulating exchange rates, and tweaking invoices... We can accelerate their economy, increasing their yield by 75% for normal resources and 50% for strategics and, and uh, luxuries. The minor faction, or the minor civilization, will grant relation rewards even when at war or in a neutral relationship. So I, I think we want to just improve our relations. It doesn't help us to improve their economy because they're not giving us a share of their economy yet. But if we improve our relations with them, they totally will. We could also reduce the cost of. The, uh, the praise action, because we are about to have access to that. This will only be active for five turns. How long is it going to take me to research? Okay, so we're not going to be ready to praise them in the next five turns. So I guess we want to just improve image then. Okay. And that is a hacking operation that is currently running, but we could we could fire off another hack here. I suppose we ought to. No sense in not having them running. Can I just throw another hack at this planet, or do I have to wait? And, I have to wait until. Oh, my hacking operation triggered an intrusion alert when it passed through this node. The enemy is likely tracing us and may respond when the trace completes. Interesting. I don't know how to interact with that. Okay, so it doesn't. We would start a new hacking operation here. There's no outcome available on this uncivilized system. Uh, we can send a hack out to this node and put up a put up one of our hacking things there and get the benefit of the node, which is 50 science. Okay, that seems cool. Let's do that. And we've discovered the Deuvians. All those probes we sent out are bearing fruit. Well, let's say hello. They are pragmatic little spider robots. Their trait is the art of science, minus 10% on technology costs. That is a great trait. We definitely want to try to assimilate them. Alright, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's a complicated game. The galaxy holds many secrets. Weird physics, strange life forms. Hey, I know how curiosities... You know that I know how curiosities work. I've already done a bunch of exploration. You know what? I think maybe we get it. I'm just going to go ahead and turn Tutorial Man off. And we can turn him back on if it turns out that I've missed something. 
Uh, let's just keep exploring stuff here. So next turn we'll generate another probe, we'll explore the last curiosity, and then we will be done. Uh, in the meantime, they're they are really getting to love us. So when we re when we reach 25 approval with them, when our relationship reaches 25, they'll start to contribute some of their economy to us. Basically, they're they're going to pay uh, pay tribute. When we get to 50 percent, they'll contribute even more, and we'll be able to take on a quest. And if we complete their quest, we will assimilate them. Uh, they will become they'll start to contribute more stuff to us, and we'll get their faction trait. Uh, these faction traits on these minor factions that we've seen so far seem very good. I'm extremely eager to get some assimilation going. Uh, and you... I guess before we do anything else, let's send off your probe. Just kind of like out here. See if anything else is going on. And we're going to have this guy just get moving. We'll go to uh, Kerr and send off some more probes in this direction, I guess. Just keep trying to meet as many factions as we can so that we can help ease their suffering. Alright, so we're getting buildings done. We've got our Plasma of Metallurgy, so this is a couple of effects. First of all, we have a new building we can research. It still appears to do nothing. I remember there was a tooltip bug before, and there was a fix for it. I don't remember what that fix was. Uh, but the other thing that that does is it has enabled Hyperium Extraction, so we are now ga gathering one Hyperium per turn from Nexus. Uh, we will use that Hyperium to build various buildings and also uh, ship modules for combat. As a somewhat distant concern, though. Alright, so you have a probe right now, right? Let's send out this probe, just kind of out into the darkness. And then I'm going to have this guy go beyond Takim. Here we are going to explore Takim's final explorable curiosity. We can see that there's another curiosity, but we don't have the technology to explore it just yet. That's a thing we can research as we uh, continue to expand into the science quadrant of the research research wheel. Right, so we're going to take our other point in Optimal Operations Expert. And I believe it is turn 9 that we will be able to reassign. Yeah, okay. So we'll, uh, we'll pop him back as a governor on turn 9. We discovered that this system suffers from, or this planet suffers from meteor strikes. Uh, we also discovered a battle tactic that allows us to use lifeboats. Okay. We'll talk about battle tactics later, when we actually start fighting stuff. Alright, so I guess I'm going to have you head out as well. There's no sense in hanging out here. Okay, looks like we're going to get to do one more little bit of exploration. So our, uh, our hero gains XP whenever we fire off a probe uh, on a curiosity, whenever we do an expedition. And also, a hero in a fleet uh, gets a little bit of XP whenever that fleet discovers a new node, I believe. Alright, so we're working hard on assimilating these minor factions, doing our best. Okay, this system has no curiosities. No, never mind, it totally does. So we've discovered here... Just a cache of something that gave us influence. We have a bunch of influence to work with. Oh, we got to keep an eye on our um, our laws and stuff too. So, our approval has risen slightly. I'm not a hundred percent clear why. Plus six approval from leading political parties in the system, uh, but we are we are still taking a four point popularity or four point approval hit from the Cram Exam Act. If we get up to 56 approval, or 57, I think the I think the switch over to happy is at 61%. If we get up, basically, though, if it were the case that our uh, Cram Exam Act were reducing our approval by enough to take us down a level from happy to content, then we would probably want to cancel it, because the 15% uh, science and dust boost from being happy uh, would be uh, more worthwhile than the effects of the Cram Exam Act. It's a thing we do need to keep an eye on. Alright, so here on turn 9, we're going to search one more Final Curiosity with our uh, with our hero fleet. And then we're going to pull the hero back. This has been a good little boost to our hero level, though. We discovered some star charts revealing 
this note over here, and yeah, okay, not a lot of actual interesting information. I'm gonna have this guy come over here as well. He has some he has some probes we can finish exploring. But the hero won't get the XP for those, because it's not the hero's fleet doing it. So we may as well go ahead and grab our hero now. Alright, so just by being here, we've gotten a significant boost to our influence. And then uh, we're getting more food and industry for each citizen on each planet. I think Fasal Staccato is going to be a very good governor. Alright, let us uh, finish exploring the system, though. The first time we zoom way in on a system, we get that like little view where it goes through each of the planets. Uh, so I overzoomed a little bit there, is why we saw that. We discovered the design for the Honeycomb Scope, which is a system improvement that gives a bunch of vision. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily very useful for us. Also, apparently this planet has Kessler Syndrome, just a bunch of space junk, uh, dead satellites and whatnot. It's unfortunate. Okay, we've become cordial with the Galvran. We've now got enough positive diplomatic relations with them that they are starting to pay us tribute. So 10 dust, 10 science, and 2 manpower per turn. That's actually really nice. How's that tracing thing going? Okay, we also triggered an intrusion alert when we sent through that other operation. Uh, I'm not sure what the outcome of this is going to be. It might just be a diplomatic thing. They might call us up and say, uh, hey, what are you doing? We detected that all kinds of computer stuff is happening. Do we need to be worried? Oh, another player. Horatio. Okay, so we've seen him, but he has not seen us. We could introduce ourselves. But I think for now, I'm okay with him not knowing that I exist. Yeah, making proper contact with the other players is always a little dangerous. We're going to uh, keep going in this direction, though, now that we know that there's another player probably on our constellation, because I want to find his systems and I want to hack them very badly, even though I don't really know what the outcome of that will be. All right, um, so do we want to continue improving our existing planet or do we want to go grab some other planets? I know it seems like the Interplanetary Transport Network does nothing here, but I think it's a tooltip bug. Because I can't imagine they would leave the building, like, if it really didn't do anything, they would just not allow us to build it. I'm gonna build it. I th I'm pretty sure that what this what this should be doing is giving us industry for, uh, on planets that have uh, uh, strategic resource deposits. And then we'll probably want to, at some point, start expanding out, but we don't have a ton of population. Oh, I guess improving our uh, improving our thing to a duo crescent is probably also worth doing. It's just extra resources. Okay. Dealt with everything here. And so this turn, we finally have the ability to communicate directly with the minor factions. What's the... Status of my hack reaching Takim? Like a million years. Okay, well, that's a shame. Because I really want to, really want to reduce the cost of talking to them, but honestly, we don't even really need to praise them. Our curiosity bonus is going to get them uh, above 50 because we explored so many curiosities on their systems. So maybe we introduce ourselves to one of the other factions instead. Who do we, whose traits do we want more? I think I like these guys. The Art of Science is a very, very powerful faction trait. So we're just gonna praise them a whole bunch. I have 123 influence to work with. We're gonna spend very hard here. So each, uh, the cost of praise is affected by how many modifiers you currently have. That's why each successive one was more expensive there. If I had done one praise and then waited for it to wear off, the second praise would have had that same very low cost. But, at this rate, uh, in 10 turns, we will have 60 approval with them, which will be enough for them to be paying us pretty significantly, and enough for us to uh, take on their quest. And once we do so, we're going to have uh, some degree of influence over a pretty large area, because I think we're going to get Takim and Jane to assimilate pretty quickly as well. Also, a, pr a quest has started here. 
Your sole hero, graduate of the academy and dust adept, has requested an audience. Something has awakened, they confide. The academy has registered emissions that they do not recognize. The source is certainly an endless manufactured transponder. They do not wish to explain further, claiming that academy oaths bind them from saying more on the subject of how the signal was identified. They show their loyalty, however, in helping you discover the most efficient way to uncover the truth. Whatever the artifact is, it must be powerful and certainly had military applications. Further investigation of military technologies should provide a clue. Endless technology is safest when it is in your hands, not someone else's. So, uh, as, a, as a group, all of the players in this game, uh, when we unlock 17 technologies between the lot of us, we will uh, move this quest forward. And at that time, whoever researched the most technologies will get this reward. Whoever researched the second most will get this. And anybody who contributed at all... Or no, sorry. Just for everybody, the technologies related to the behemoth will be unveiled. This thing here in this mountain, this is not a facility. It's a ship. Uh, they're very, very large. So the idea is that heroes with their incredible powers to you know manipulate space and time and generate resources out of nothing can do this because they've been to a place called the academy and it teaches them the secrets of manipulating dust uh, i don't know how it is the case that our uh our guy here our man Fessel staccato attended the academy probably he like crept up to the academy and was real creepy outside the window and learned all of its secrets through espionage and hacking or whatever. But that's, you know, that's the an explanation for all of that quest text there. Alright, so let us continue moving on here. We are seeking the Horatio systems. You have a probe. Let's send this probe out over there. And then, yeah, both of our guys are still, still out here looking. We have hacks running. We have our defensive thing up. There's nothing really to do in the hacking window. But it just, it keeps glowing. Oh, research, yes. Uh, so what do we want to research? We probably want to research some colonization tech, right? We have some basic industry and science stuff going on. Let's, what would allow us to colonize something nearby? Or to, to put down a uh, sanctuary on something nearby. We have some arid worlds nearby. So, we could grab Pevscale Accelerators. That's probably pretty good. Uh, it will also give us access to the ability to specialize our worlds towards science, and to build magnetic field generators, which uh, I believe give you science from anomalies. It's really weird that all of the tooltips are not displaying what things actually do. I'll see if I can figure out what's going on there and get it corrected before the next episode. So, you notice there are lines here from rare earth foams to pevscale accelerators, but we don't have to have rare earth foams before we get this. Uh, it is a facilitating technology. So if we have rare earth foams, it will give us a significant discount to pevscale accelerators. Uh, I think we get the debris analyzer support module, which is a thing we can install in our ships to get extra science after battles for each command point of, of ships that we destroyed. And it will also give us the ability to build sanctuaries on Mediterranean worlds. We'll probably want this eventually. We may as well just uh, just grab that. And then we'll get Pevscale Accelerators afterward. Okay, and I think actually with that... Oh, we didn't actually use all of our movement here. Alright, we can't see what's at the end of the Starling yet. I think with that, maybe that's a good place to stop. I know this uh, this video was an awful lot of time spent for not a whole lot of turns. Don't worry, we won't have to explain so much stuff going forward, so things will be a little bit faster. Uh, but that is going to be it for us for today. The plan for this series is to release a new episode every, uh, every weekday, a new hour-long episode every weekday. So uh, there will probably be a couple ep extra episodes like over the weekend here as we dig into the expansion mechanics. Uh, so come back next time, tomorrow, to see more of us figuring out how in the hell hacking works. And we'll see you then.